live. Okay, we might make a start. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the elective, Is Jesus a Racist and a Bigot? And uh, Peter Orr, Peter Orr uh, New Testament faculty here, will be taking us through that. Uh, just a bit of housekeeping. I should introduce myself. My name's Gordon. I'm a fourth year student. I'm really enjoying my time here at Moore College. Um, there will be a chance to ask questions later, and so we're going to use Slido. The code for this particular elective is there, J843. Um, so let me hand it over to Pete. Pete, uh, he's married to Emma, and they have four boys. Uh, he's on the New Testament faculty here at Moore College. On a fun day, you can find Pete uh, schooling the students on the cricket pitch. Um, it's a big, big highlight for his week. Um, so that's all I'll say. <laughs> Pete, I'll get you to come up. <laughs> Thank you, Gordon. Uh, welcome, everyone. Welcome for those on the live stream. Uh, so as Gordon said, the Slido code is J843. J843. Um, and um, we'll, we'll try and keep an eye on the live stream to make sure that um, everything is, uh, is okay for, uh, for you guys. Uh, why don't I pray, and then we'll uh, look at our topic uh, together. Let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, your word. We thank you for the Lord Jesus. We thank you that uh, we can uh, think uh, today in particular about uh, important uh, questions uh, questions about uh, the Christian life, uh, questions about uh, relating to one another as uh, men and women, and uh, this afternoon uh, relating to one another uh, in terms of different races. And uh, we pray that as we look at these passages in Mark and Matthew, that you would give us understanding from your word. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I'm just going to pause to make sure everything's okay. My head's cut off. That's not a good thing. <laughs> so live stream are all okay? Yep. Brilliant. Okay, so as Gordon said, uh, this afternoon we're looking at the, um, uh, the topic, uh, was Jesus a racist and a bigot? Now, just in case you fall asleep or just in case the live stream cuts out, uh, the answer is no. Okay, so I just want to put that up, uh, up front. The answer is no. Sorry if that's kind of cut the tension. And, um, but the answer is no. Uh, what, why, why would we even think about a asking that question? Well, uh, Mark and Matthew both describe Jesus' encounter with a Syrophoenician woman. Uh, you know the story if we combine uh, their different accounts. Uh, this uh, woman comes to Jesus and asks her to heal her daughter. Uh, her daughter is possessed by a demon. And Jesus responds by telling her that it would be wrong to take bread from the children and to give it to the dogs, implying that as a Gentile, it would be wrong for him to heal um, her daughter. Uh, the woman persists and gives a snappy reply, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And for that snappy reply, uh, the woman's daughter is healed. It's a challenging encounter. Uh, we'll look at... Uh, Matthew and Mark uh, separately in a moment because they do um, highlight different things but both of them describe this woman begging Jesus to heal her daughter and both recount Jesus reply to this desperate woman and it's on the outline uh, it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs firstly Jesus says it's not right it's not good or appropriate for him to heal this woman's daughter. And then, perhaps more confrontingly, he effectively calls this woman and her daughter dogs. Now, this woman succeeds, it seems, in convincing uh, Jesus to change his mind. Uh, in uh, Mark, Jesus tells her that it's her word or her reply that secures healing. In Matthew, it's more directly her faith that is the reason uh, for her healing. Uh, the issue that this encounter throws up for us is, does this woman cause Jesus to change her mind? Is, is Jesus going one way? And because of this snappy reply, does, Jesus cause, uh, does the woman cause Jesus to change his mind? And then if we say yes, there are a couple of other uh, questions. If Jesus did change his mind, what, what exactly did he change his mind about? Now, the common approach in more academic uh, treatments is to argue that Jesus changed his mind with respect to the Gentile mission. 
so Matthew's gospel has a very interesting dynamic in that we move from uh, an Israel-only mission in the middle of Matthew's gospel. So you remember when Jesus sends the disciples out in chapter 10, he says, you know, to the lost sheep of Israel only, don't go into the, uh, the towns of the Gentiles or even the Samaritans. And then Jesus himself in uh, chapter 15 says, you know, I was sent for the, the lost sheep of Israel only. But by the end of uh, Matthew's gospel, we've got the Great Commission. Go into all the world, make disciples of all nations. So what's the reason for the, the shift from the middle of Matthew's gospel, where Jesus says just Israel only, to the end of the gospel when it's the Gentiles as well? Well, some people argue that uh, it's this encounter with this woman that is part of the answer. In other words, she uh, is used by God to change Jesus' mind. That, that's the way that some people argue. However, in more recent popular works, the change in Jesus has been argued to be that he gave up his racist attitudes, okay? Now, this, this is something that is fairly common in um, at least popular level treatments uh, of this passage. So I've got some um, quotes on uh, the outline, which I want to read in, in their entirety so you get a feel for the sort of things that people are saying about these encounters. So here's the first one. Uh, this passage captures an important moment when the woman points out the fallacy of Jesus' thinking. He learns from it and changes his attitudes. He's essentially saying, you got me. You're right. I was wrong. Um, you didn't deserve that insult. You're clever and brave. You've got chutzpah. I give you what you've asked for, what I should have given you right from the start, healing for the daughter you love, the daughter you're desperate to save, the daughter I should care about as much as I cared for Jairus' daughter, whom I raised from the death, as much as I, I cared for the woman who I freed from seven demons, the woman who I freed from a crippling back deformity, the woman who was healed instantly as she touched my cloak. I called her daughter, but I called you and your daughter dogs. That was wrong of me. I'm sorry. I'll be better, I'll be best. Or, it's uncomfortable to watch Jesus succumb to the same prejudice that we fall victim to. It's disturbing to see him place walls and barriers in front of suffering people just like we do. It's strange to think that Jesus would deny anyone compassion just because they're different from him, just as we're often guilty of doing. Jesus learns something about giving up his own prejudice. Jesus learns what it's like to have his own walls and barriers broken down. By holding Jesus' prejudice up before him, by making her need for compassion heard, uh, Jesus breaks open uh, God's compassion into the world. Compassion and mercy given to, the, to more than just the children of Israel. Compassion now for Jew and Gentile alike. Perhaps more strongly, uh, Jesus uttered an ethnic slur. To dismiss a desperate woman with a seriously sick child? Uh, our immediate response likely is, of course not. Jesus couldn't have uttered a slur. But Jesus' exchange with the Syrophoenician woman seems to tell a different story. No matter what theological tap dance we perform, we can't avoid it. Jesus calls the unnamed woman a dog, an ethnic slur common at the time. To be clear, while there's some debate about the social and cultural dynamics at work here, Jesus holds all the power, the power in this exchange. The woman doesn't approach with arrogance or a sense of entitlement associated with wealth and privilege. Rather, she comes to him in the most human way possible, desperate and pleading for her daughter. And he responds by dehumanizing her with ethnic prejudice, if not bigotry. In our modern terms, we know that power plus prejudice equals racism. Or finally, and perhaps most strongly of all, uh, William O'Brien wonders uh, if, in a sense, this encounter is a two-way exorcism. The Syrophoenician woman's daughter is freed from her unclean spirit and an unclean spirit of residual ethnic chauvinism is cast out of Jesus. Now, if your reaction is anything like mine, uh, it would be a mixture of kind of horror and kind of rolling your eyes at such kind of terrible readings of these passages and, and terrible understandings of uh, the Lord Jesus. But I want us to think carefully about why they're wrong. 
And before we do that, though, I, I just, I'm not in any way defending them, but we do need to recognize that in the humanity of Jesus, he did grow and develop. So Luke's gospel, which, which doesn't actually have this account, which is interesting, tells us that Jesus in chapter 2 increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. So perhaps the more restrained view that this encounter was something of a trigger for Jesus to develop in his understanding concerning Gentile mission uh, is not theologically impossible. I don't think it's what's going on here, but writing off the idea of, of sort of development in Jesus' understanding is not necessarily wrong, but you know, we're going to see that these extreme views are uh, way off the mark. Uh, the popular views, as we said, they've gone, they've gone one step further, or maybe actually a hundred steps further, in charging Jesus with racism, ethnic chauvinism, even having a, a, an unclean spirit of ethnic chauvinism. And here, I think, is an example of a contemporary issue, an important contemporary issue, uh, one that we'll speak about uh, towards the end, but so coloring people's reading of the Bible that they actually end up arguing that Jesus is racist. So um, really, in one sense, this session is um, about you know, how, to read, how to read the Bible correctly and how to uh, navigate the, um, you know, the problem on one side of, of, of ignoring what the Bible says about uh, racism on the other side of being so consumed about it, we see it everywhere, even to the extent that we would charge the Lord Jesus himself with racist attitudes. So what I want to do is focus in on two questions, though. Uh, the first question is, uh, why does Jesus refuse to heal the daughter? Okay. And then secondly, why does Jesus refer to the woman and her daughter as dogs? Now, I imagine we're sort of more drawn to that second question of, you know, why does he use this language? But I think it's the first question that will help us to answer the second question. So we'll spend most of our time thinking about what, why this refusal, why does Jesus refuse this desperate woman healing, at least uh, on, the, on the first go? Um, but before we sort of dig in, I just want to talk about two ways that people have approached uh, these passages and these questions in particular. And uh, the first one is uh, to argue um, that um, the language of dog, pe people say was a typical insult uh, of uh, Gentiles by Jews. But uh, in both Matthew and Mark's gospel, it's, it's uh, the diminu diminutive form of the word uh, for dog. And so people have understood it, have, have argued that it should be translated as puppies, okay, rather than, uh, you know, the, the, the street dogs, okay, but even, even those who make that point do acknowledge that that doesn't necessarily alleviate the problem, uh, you know, there's a big difference between a child and a puppy, uh, even a cute one. Um, the second approach um, which some have, have made uh, or taken is that it's the woman who's the racist. Now, how does that work? Well, uh, I, I guess we're more familiar when we read John's Gospel and uh, John chapter 4 and the encounter with Jesus and the Samaritan woman. We know that uh, Jews and Samaritans had problems uh, with each other. But there was actually a similar sort of temp uh, tension between the people of Galilee and the people of uh, Tyre. Tyre was a wealthier, wealthier area and uh, there is evidence that uh, Tyre exploited Galilee for grain. And uh, Josephus, uh, the Jewish historian, reflects on um, an incident where a number of Jews were killed by people from Tyre. And that may explain some of the tension. Uh, in fact, some have argued that the woman in this instance may have had the upper hand uh, politically. So uh, again, this quote is on the uh, outline. Uh, what if the Canaanite woman is white and Jesus is black? Uh, Tyre and Sidon is the Canaanite woman's turf. As a Jew, Jesus is the outsider there. Uh, Tyson, who's the, uh, the, the scholar who's sort of most known for this uh, view, 
further suggests that for a Gentile woman to walk unaccompanied into a Jewish home and demand healing for her daughter shows the presumptuous chutzpah of an upper-class social status. So how does it change how we hear the story if we make the Canaanite woman a rich white lady and Jesus a poor black faith healer? Now, it's a really interesting take, and it does illustrate the value in understanding the historical background and the social context of the first century as we read the Gospels. It it does underline the fact that Jews in the first century, um, um, even in Palestine, were not the oppressors. You know, they're, they're, they're under Roman rule. Um, to sort of think of, you know, the Jews as the oppressors is to read this through uh, 21st century kind of social justice dynamics, and it's anachronistic. Um, you know, it's, it's not as if Jesus is the kind of rich, white, Wall Street trader, and the woman is, you know, the immigrant cleaner in, in his office. That, that's to misconstrue what's going on here. Um, Nevertheless, I think, um, I think that reading overreaches a little bit. We're, we're going to come back to it because I think it does highlight a few helpful things, but I think it's, it's to overreach it. So, um, you know, the way that the quote sort of talks about this woman demanding healing, that's not the stance that the woman um, kind of portrays towards Jesus. So I think it's, it's a tempting way to sort of just neatly solve uh, the problem, but I think it, it goes uh, too far. Uh, so what I want to do is just um, look at both passages in Mark and Matthew fairly uh, closely and to see that there's more going on than first meets uh, the eye. I think that's worth doing with any passage, but I think doing it with this encounter as it's described in these two passages is especially important because of the way we've seen this encounter being politicized. Uh, we need to look at these passages closely because it's so easy to distort their meaning and begin to assert things about Jesus, which I think, uh, you know, denigrate his person and are, are ultimately extremely helpful. Some of the blogs and, and uh, others that are quoted earlier um, make the point that engaging in some kind of close reading that we're about to do is just theologians trying to escape the uncomfortable truth of Jesus' um, racism. I don't think that's true. Rather, it's a reminder that as much as God's word is God's word for us, It was originally written in a first century context. Matthew and Mark wrote their Gospels in the first century. And we have to read them in the light of the first century and not read them as if they were written yesterday. Uh, The discomfort we have from reading the Scripture is often the discomfort we have from our own cultural blind spots. So I think this is something of a case study in how we read the Bible in the light of 20th century issues like racism, but there are other issues as well. At the same time, uh, we are situated in the 21st century. Uh, We live in a world that is increasingly sensitive to issues of race and racism. And so we will step back uh, and think about what this encounter says to those kind of situations. But to make sure we hear these passages, uh, we need to read them carefully. Uh, so we'll look at Mark, and then we'll look at Matthew, and as I said, we'll concentrate initially on this idea of what, what, is the, what is the reason that Jesus refuses to heal firstly, and then, um, then does heal uh, this woman. So Mark's gospel, uh, Mark chapter 7, uh, verses 24 uh, to 30. L- let me read it. And from there he arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and did not want anyone to know, yet he could not be hidden. But immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, for this statement, you may go your way. The demon excuse me, the demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. Well, as we turn to this passage, the first thing we need to do is to make sure we understand it in the context of Mark's gospel. Uh, From the beginning of chapter seven, what's been happening? Well, Jesus has been debating with the Pharisees concerning the nature of ritual purity. Uh, They accuse Jesus of allowing his disciples to eat with unwashed uh, ritually unwashed hands. 
And uh, this leads Jesus to reflect on the nature of defilement. Uh, It doesn't come from uh, unclean hands, but an unclean heart. Chapter 7, verse 20, what comes out of a person is what defiles them. So I don't think it's a coincidence that immediately we have this description um, of an encounter with uh, the Syrophoenician woman, someone who would have been regarded uh, by the Pharisees as richly impure. As we see uh, this woman encounter Jesus, she falls down at his feet and uh, begs him to heal her daughter. She's not displaying the presumptuous uh, chutzpah of an upper-class social status. Okay, So that reading, I don't think, uh, helps us. Uh, Verse 26, she's a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged him to cast the demon out of her her, uh, her daughter. Uh, Mark's highlighting the woman's identity by using um, a a, a two-step description, and um, Mark likes to do this, and uh, sometimes it's just incidental details. So in chapter 1, he talks about when evening came after the sun had set. Okay, sort of saying the same thing twice, but just to to underline it, it's just Mark's style. However, this peculiar uh, description here emphasizes that this woman was um, a a Gentile. She's a a Gentile, she's a Syrophoenician, she's unquestionably not a Jew, she's an outsider. You know, have you got that? You know, she's an outsider, she's not a Jew. Uh, I guess we're, we're sometimes too familiar with the story or we're too blasé with the idea of Gentiles being included in God's kingdom because, you know, I imagine that uh, many, most of us are Gentiles. But for a Gentile woman to approach Jesus, it's not something that we've seen before in Mark's gospel. However, we have seen a woman affected by uncleanness approach Jesus earlier in the gospel. Not a Gentile woman, but a woman who would have been regarded as ritually impure. Uh, the woman suffering from the persistent uh, from persistent bleeding um, is healed, and then uh, she has this interaction with Jesus, where she falls down before Jesus, and uh, is met with words of encouragement from him back in chapter five. Okay, so we we this idea of someone considered richly impure, a woman approaching Jesus and falling down that that's not new in Mark's gospel. And actually, Jesus interacting with Gentiles is not new in Mark's gospel. Uh, In chapter 4, verse 35, Jesus tells the disciples, let's go across to the other side, uh, meaning the other side of uh, the Lake of Galilee. Uh, And uh, this is followed by Jesus calming the storm before, in chapter 5, he comes into the country of the Gerasenes and uh, his encounter with the man who could not be chained. And uh, Jesus, you'll remember, cast out a legion of spirits uh, into a herd of pigs. Uh, A number of uh, commentators try to downplay the Gentile character of this encounter, but uh, David Garland is one commentator who I think helpfully underlines how significant the encounter is. Uh, Jesus crosses the lake to an area where pigs are kept. And in doing so, uh, it's clear that he is going into Gentile territory, and he's showing that there is no place in the world that God's kingdom does not intend to exert itself. Uh, This man uh, uh, from whom um, the demons are are driven out, um, he is presented as the most unclean of Gentiles. Uh, He lives in the tombs. Uh, He's too strong to be chained by uh, human beings. He's bleeding. Uh, He has unclean spirits. Uh, He's even named, uh, you know, with the demons in him, he named after a fighting unit of the Roman army, a legion. Uh, He shared his location with pigs. And uh, it's interesting, again, if we were to look um, at at Mark's gospel, we can see that Mark parallels legion um, with Jairus on the other side of uh, the lake. Okay, so one is an unclean Gentile, Uh, One is a synagogue ruling uh, Jew. Uh, One uh, receives cleansing by falling at Jesus' feet in faith, and so does the other receive cleansing by falling at Jesus' feet in faith. Uh, Mark goes on to present Jesus as insisting that this Gentile 
uh, this one who has the, the demons uh, healed from him, should publicly share his experience of God's coming, uh, incoming kingdom with others in his region. And so uh, it's very hard to say that Mark is presenting Jesus as someone who's closed to the possibility of Gentiles uh, receiving um, uh, the blessing of his ministry. In other words, any idea that the Syrophoenician woman manages to change Jesus, change Jesus' mind regarding the appropriateness of God's blessing going to the Gentiles uh, fails to give full weight to the fact that he'd already engaged in precisely this uh, in a particularly dramatic way. In fact, you could say that the woman's response to Jesus is more reflective of what's happening in, in, in Mark's gospel. No, it's, it's, it's right for you to, uh, to, to, to heal the Gentiles. You've done it already. So what is going on here in this uh, encounter between Jesus and this um, Syrophoenician woman? Uh, why does he initially refuse to heal uh, her daughter? Well, the alternative proposal is that Jesus, in his interaction with this woman, always intended to heal her daughter, but his words were designed to provoke faith in her. Now, this uh, view actually has a long history. Uh, Chrysostom, uh, for example, uh, argued that not in insult were his words spoken, but calling her for forth and revealing the treasure laid up in her. So to draw out the faith that, that, that is in her. According to Calvin, the woman thinks the door is closed on her, but Jesus' intent is to make her try in faith to get through the cracks in the wood. However, this uh, view fell out of uh, um, kind of favor in the 20th century, um, with one commentator saying that this kind of test of faith reading um, turns the woman into a, a teacher's lesson plan. Um, uh, people argue that, that Jesus' harshness reveals an actual rejection of the, of the woman, um, and it's her counter-argument that persuades Jesus to change his mind. Uh, related to this is the question of whether the woman is an example of someone who displays humble faith. So, you know, Chrysostom, Calvin, it's, it's to draw the faith out of this woman. Um, but the, the kind of 20th century reading would say, no, no, she's not. She's, she's not presented as someone in faith. She's presented to, uh, as someone who, by her force of argument, changes uh, Jesus' mind. And so at the end of the encounter, Jesus doesn't highlight her faith. He doesn't say, you know, you're, uh, you've got wonderful faith. It's her word that um, secures uh, the healing. However, again, if we read Mark's gospel more widely, we notice that Jesus can present people who display faith, um, or sorry, that Mark can present people who display faith without actually using the word faith. And, and in fact, the parallels that we've seen with this woman coming and falling at Jesus' uh, uh, feet, and uh, the, the earlier example of the woman falling at Jesus' uh, feet, uh, that, that connection really does seem to highlight this, this is an approach of uh, faith. But perhaps more than that, Mark also shows Jesus testing the faith of others. That is something that Jesus does in Mark's gospel. And interestingly, he does it in the context, like this woman, of bread. So just before uh, the feeding of the 5,000, uh, when the disciples recognize that the people need to be fed given the late hour, uh, what does Jesus say to them? You give them something to eat. Uh, here's a test of their faith, which the disciples immediately fail. <laughs> Are we meant to go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? Uh, when the disciples are later astonished at Jesus uh, walking on water, uh, Mark comments that they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. Uh, later, just before the feeding of the 4,000, we have another interaction between Jesus and the disciples. Uh, where at this time, Jesus is the one who recognizes the people uh, uh, need to be fed. And uh, here he doesn't issue a test directly, uh, but the disciples display their failure to understand when they say, how, how can you feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? They still haven't got it. Uh, these two bread tests, if you like, occur on either side of chapter 7, which describe the discussion with the Pharisees concerning ritual purity 
and which includes this encounter with the Syrophoenician woman. Again, Jesus finds himself talking to someone, this time a Gentile woman, about providing bread. And this time, unlike the disciples, the woman answers in a way that demonstrates that she understands who Jesus is. So in the context of of Mark's gospel, where we've got discussions of bread and kind of faith, uh, I think that helps us to understand what is going on here. But I think the wider biblical context helps us too because this is not the first miracle in the Bible involving bread that has occurred in Tyre and Sidon. Elijah in 1 Kings 17 uh, miraculously provides uh, flour and oil for the widow of uh, Zarephath, which was part of Sidon. But interestingly, before he performs the miracle, what does Elijah do? He first asks for a morsel of bread. In fact, some have suggested that the way that Jesus withdraws to Tyre and Sidon following the encounter with the Pharisees parallels the way that Elijah had withdrawn to the same area following his encounter with Ahab. So uh, Matthew Malcolm, uh, and I've put um, a link to his article uh, on the handout, very, very helpful article. Um, Matthew Malcolm has argued uh, what is going on here is uh, that prompted by... uh, Moses' provision of bread in the wilderness and its kind of, in a sense, repetition, if you like, in the Elijah, Elisha narratives, Jesus uses this idea of bread as a means of representing and drawing out uh, the disciples' recognition of him as God's appointed provider. The disciples should grasp in the bread parables Uh, the the miracles as an indication of who Jesus is. Indeed, we've we've been told that to uh, to the disciples the secret of the kingdom has been given. However, Jesus' disciples, even though they're insiders, are dangerously close to behaving like outsiders. They repeatedly fail to see, hear, or understand who Jesus is. Uh, Mark draws this out by depicting their lack of time to eat uh, bread and their failure to understand Jesus' references to bread. But where the disciples fail, this woman, an outsider, succeeds in grasping the significance of who Jesus is. As Malcolm puts it, the bread-seeking woman provides a poignant counterpoint to the bread-lacking disciples. Just as Elijah tests the widow by first asking her to make some bread, uh, Jesus tests this woman. Now, even if we don't accept the Elijah parallel, some don't, in Mark's gospel, we've already uh, seen parables which function to test people. Uh, Jesus, in effect, is, is uttering a parable to this woman. And parables throughout Mark's gospel are effectively like riddles that are designed to divide people into insiders and outsiders. And I think... We have a parable here in Jesus' interaction with this woman, or a riddle, uh, by the fact that, as one commentator puts it, the bread metaphor, it doesn't fit the woman's request. Jesus isn't being asked for food, uh, but for his help as a a physician, an exorcist. And uh, more than that, the, the bread analogy suggests that somehow Jesus' ability to heal is limited. It's like a finite resource. In other words, if he heals this woman's daughter, then there might not be enough power left over for his own people. Yet nowhere in Mark's gospel is Jesus presented as having that kind of limited power. So in other words, it's more going on than just a very simple um, interaction. And Jesus' words to this disciple, I think, are in the form of a parable. And parables in Mark's gospel test and draw out the faith of, of the people that he interacts with. So Jesus is uttering a parable to explain in in a cryptic way the reason why uh, he will not heal her daughter. But the parable begs not only to be understood but also challenged. Uh, In response to the woman challenging the riddle, Jesus says, 729, because of your answer, because of this statement, uh, go. And that sounds much more like she's passed the test than she's changed his mind. She hasn't outwitted Jesus or changed his mind, but she's understood the parable uh, which uh, Jesus has expressed to her. Uh, The Syrophoenician woman um, uh, recognizes uh, that what Jesus says to her initially 
uh, that you, know, you can't take the bread from the, the children doesn't fit uh, with what uh, has led her to approach Jesus initially. And so she, in a sense, responds with a revised parable that reflects her knowledge of the inclusive nature of Jesus' ministry. And she's the only person in Mark's gospel who shows an immediate understanding of one of his parables and so demonstrates her status as a kingdom insider. Even if in the eyes of the Pharisees, she would be regarded as unclean and defiled. As such, she takes her place as one of the key female characters in Mark's gospel who model what discipleship looks like. Uh, together with the woman uh, with the um, persistent bleeding, uh, the, woman, the widow in the temple treasury, and the woman who anoints Jesus at Bethany. These kind of striking examples of discipleship in Mark's gospel um, are, are women. And here we have uh, a Gentile woman. All right, let's look at Matthew's gospel, and then we're going to come back to the, the kind of question of the, the actual uh, language that Jesus uses. So uh, Matthew uh, chapter 15. And uh, verse 21. And Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she is crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. She said, yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And the daughter was healed instantly. Now, when we come to Matthew's gospel, we might expect that we'd read an identical account of what happened in Mark. But Matthew wants to bring out uh, subtle differences because he wants to emphasize different things from this encounter uh, with this woman. Uh, The same event can be used to draw uh, different implications. Uh, Matthew's using the same event to bring out slightly different aspects. And uh, what we see here is actually Matthew's account is more extreme than Mark's account both in the seeming harshness of Jesus' response to the woman, but also in his commendation to her afterwards. So interestingly, Matthew describes the woman not just from uh, Syrophoenicia, not just a Gentile, but a Canaanite. Uh, the only use of this word in the New Testament, Canaanite, what's that significant? The, you know, the ancient enemy of God's people. She's not just an outsider, she's an enemy. Uh, Further, Matthew has the woman pleading with Jesus much more earnestly. Verse 22, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. And it's fascinating that uh, this Canaanite, this enemy of God's people, addresses Jesus as son of David. Then Matthew describes Jesus uh, rebuffing the woman not once, but three times. Okay, so chapter 23, uh, sorry, verse 23, he did not answer her a word. He ignores her. Uh, Verse 24, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And then, you know, she kneels, begs him, and then verse 26, it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dog. So he he kind of knocks her back three times. And uh, note that there was, there's no first as there was in Mark's gospel. You know, I was sent first to the lost sheep of Israel. That, that's, that's not there in Matthew's account. Uh, for Jesus in Matthew is only sent to the lost sheep of um, Israel. And we've noticed that already uh, when Jesus sent the disciples out in chapter 10, it was only to Israel. And then yet we have at the end of the gospel, Jesus uh, is sent to take uh, disciples of all nations. So um, people have argued that perhaps in Matthew more strongly, uh, this encounter is being presented as the sort of trigger that changes Jesus' mind uh, regarding 
uh, mission uh, to the world. Um, but the negatives in the passage, uh, I think, more sharply highlight or underscore the significance of the resolution of uh, the encounter. Uh, we see that in the way that Jesus responds to the woman, not simply with an assurance uh, that her daughter has been healed, but with a much more emphatic affirmation of the significance of uh, her faith. Uh, oh, woman, great is your faith. Um, be it done for you as uh, you desire. Uh, oh, uh, woman, great is your faith. Uh, Jesus has said that to, to uh, one other person in Matthew's gospel, great is your faith. And it's also a Gentile. It's the centurion back in chapter 8. And uh, what's interesting is in the encounter with the centurion, um, Jesus also questions him to provoke his faith. And uh, it's obscured in some of the English translations, and you can see it on uh, the outline. Um, now, th this, is, this is not, you don't have to read it this way, but reading it as a question is one possibility. So you can see the ESV doesn't read it as a question. This in, um, uh, when the centurion comes and talks about his, um, his servant, and he said to him, I will come and heal him. Uh, but you could read it as a question, as the NIV and the, the Christian Standard Bible. Shall I come uh, to heal him? Shall I come and heal him? And most commentators would argue that actually uh, Jesus is issuing a question to the centurion, which again is to challenge his faith. And the man responds wonderfully, you know, confessing his understanding of authority. You know, I'm not worthy to have you come under, uh, you know, under my house. And Jesus affirms his faith strongly, chapter 8, verse 10. Hearing this, Jesus was amazed and said to those following him, I assure you I have not found anyone in Israel with so great faith. Okay, so this, this wonderful connection, chapter 8, chapter 15, this affirmation of great faith, which is sort of drawn out of this centurion, out of this woman by Jesus uh, questioning. And... Uh, Kind of chapter 8, chapter 15, in between, we have um, the disciples being sent out, chapter 10, only to the house of Israel. Uh, so even though that's true, it's Gentiles who are demonstrating the faith that Jesus wants. Um, and uh, as such, with this Syrophoenician woman, uh, Jesus, I think, is commending her understanding that Jesus is the one who brings salvation to the Gentiles. And so she's anticipating the universality of the gift of salvation, which Jesus himself will announce after his resurrection and exaltation as Lord of the world. So I think in Matthew's gospel, uh, like we saw in Mark's gospel, what's going on here is, is, is more significant than just the encounter itself. It's not just that it's one encounter amongst uh, many. It has a sort of structural importance to Matthew's gospel. Chapter 8, chapter 15, these, encounter, uh, these encounters with uh, Gentiles are the first and last narratives in which the faith of those who seek help is mentioned. This is one commentator puts it. These two encounters, each one of which speaks of the great faith uh, found among Gentiles, uh, form a frame. And only these kind of frame encounters speak of great faith and for the same reason, the faith of the centurion and the Canaanite woman anticipate the final goal of Jesus' mission. Uh, this uh, indicates that for Matthew 2, faith in Jesus is a central factor in the coming of people from the Gentiles and for overcoming the boundary that separated Israel from the nations of the world. And this woman anticipates the fact that it is in Israel's Messiah that will be help, hope for the world as she addresses Jesus, not just as Lord, but as son of David. Her understanding is that in, uh, it is Israel's Messiah that will bring hope for the world, for Gentiles uh, like her. And so just as with the account of Mark's gospel, uh, Jesus' response is, is designed to demonstrate this woman's faith. Uh, Matthew has not included uh, her encounter with Jesus to portray Jesus in a negative light or to underline uh, the superiority of the Jews. Now, this encounter is described here to demonstrate that even though there was a, a chronological priority to Jesus' mission to, to Israel, this was always understood by God, by Jesus himself, 
to lead to a later mission to the Gentiles and to the rest of the world. So I think when we look at uh, Matthew's gospel, uh, Mark's gospel, uh, this uh, question, did, uh, did the woman che- change Jesus' mind? I, I don't think you can really um, uh, argue that when you situate these um, encounters in, in both gospels. You see an already openness to, uh, to Gentiles in both gospels. You see, particularly in Matthew's gospel, the, 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 centurion, the Gentile centurion being commended uh, for his faith. But I want to come back to this uh, second question. And uh, the second question is the one perhaps that we feel uh, the most. And uh, that is, you know, did Jesus um, utter a racial slur? And so those kind of popular treatments that we saw earlier, um, you know, Jesus uttered an ethnic slur. Uh, You know, Jesus uh, demonstrated uh, prejudice. Um, I think one of them, I've lost it, but, you know, this kind of common, yet dehumanizing her with an ethnic uh, slur, um, this kind of common uh, ethnic slur, um, you know, what what, what do we do with that, with this, you know, this idea that Jesus, whether or not he's trying to draw out, uh, you know, faith from her, which I think is is what's happening, to use... um, you know, a, a racial swear word to do that, you know, how, how do we resolve that? Uh, what Jesus says is harsh, it's striking, but uh, despite the fact that kind of commentaries will just kind of repeat this, there's actually no evidence that dog uh, was a racial slur used of Jews towards uh, Gentiles. If you look in the Old Testament, you do see the language of, of, of dog, but it's used of uh, those who are evildoers. It is used of those who are outside of the covenant people. It's not an ethnic term. It's a religious or moral term. Okay, so Psalm 22, verse 16, uh, David reflects on uh, his enemies. Um, and, you know, we remember that his enemies were uh, Israelites. Dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. So dogs are are evildoers. Or Deuteronomy 23, uh, you shall not bring the fee of a prostitute into the house of of the Lord your God in payment of any vow or the wages of a dog. Now a dog here is um, um, generally understood to be a, a male prostitute. Okay, so dog is not a racial term, it's, it's a moral term. Okay, now what Jesus says is strong and it's, it's harsh. It is a strong word, you know, it's not right to take the bread from the family members and give it to evildoers. Okay, it is a strong word. Um, it's a harsh word, but we've seen why. It's a test of faith. And uh, think, you know, in, in both cases, uh, this encounter follows the, the discussion about where does, where does defilement come from? It comes from the heart. It comes from the sinful human heart. And, uh, you know, the, this woman's response is, is, is so poignant. Um, yes, Lord, yet, you know, e- even the, the dogs deserve the crumbs. Uh, this woman, in other words, is... Um, accepting kind of Jesus verdict that she like all of human being all of humanity is evil okay so I think um, now there are diff- different reasons for it that the, the term dog after the New Testament later New Testament became it did become a racial uh, you know term that was used by Jews towards Gentiles and Gentiles towards Jews but I think at this point it, it's not a racial term Okay, it's not an ethnic slur, uh, swear word. And uh, these kind of popular treatments have just assumed that later understanding of this word. Okay, it, I'm not saying that, you know, it was a very um, kind of soft and gentle word. It, it is a striking word. It is a striking thing to say to this woman. But she agrees. Yes, Lord. I, 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 you know, I am a dog. I am evil. I am evil. Um, and yet, please have mercy on uh, me. So what these passages, I think, um, 
help us to see is yeah, what true faith looks like. Uh, it's, a, it's an acceptance, as Jesus had just said, that sin uh, resides in the heart. Um, but what these passages also helpfully illuminate is the tendency that we have uh, to read um, our culture into the Bible rather than reading it out of the Bible. R- racism is an issue. It's, it's a terrible issue in uh, our contemporary culture. But the way to tackle it is not to lay over contemporary concerns onto a passage so that we misconstru- misconstrue what it is doing. Now, we always need to read the Bible in the light of its own concerns, not ours. It's not to say that racism is not important. Uh, Peter's rebuke, uh, sorry, Paul's rebuke of Peter in Galatians 2 for not eating with Gentiles is, amongst other things, an example of you know, a racist attitude being challenged, and it, it receives the sharpest of rebukes from the Apostle Paul. But poring over the Bible for examples of sort of uh, what we might perceive as racism, I think just does what we we saw at the beginning. It leads to these kind of, frankly, blasphemous readings of uh, Scripture. But I think it's an example where in our right concern to challenge racism, we get obsessed by this one issue and it... um, um, twist the way that we, um, we read uh, scripture. There are other examples, um, not just in the Christian world. So in uh, last year, a university professor in the US was suspended for racism. Uh, he was talking about how uh, many languages have filler words. So in English, you know, we've got um and ah. And he gave the example of Mandarin, which has the word uh, N-E-G. N-E-G-A, nega, okay, nega. As soon as he said it, it caused outrage amongst the class. How could he use a word that sounded so much like the most racially charged word in the English language? Uh, Students wrote a letter that stated, in light of the murders of George Floyd and uh, Breonna Taylor and the recent and continued collective protests and social awakening across the nation, we cannot let this stand. So he, he uttered a Chinese word, a Mandarin word, that sounded like you know, a racial uh, a swear word in English. Uh, responding to the complaint, the dean of the university told students that uh, the professor would no longer be teaching the course. He said, it is simply unacceptable for the faculty to use words in class that can marginalize, hurt, and harm the psychological safety of our students. He was then suspended. That led to a backlash. Uh, One post on the internet called the incident a contemporary version of the literary inquisition, uh, referring to the persecution of uh, intellectuals during China's imperial era. Uh, What began as an accusation against the professor of using discriminatory language has morphed, in China at least, into accusations of discrimination against the Chinese language. Uh, Is it now forbidden to speak Chinese in the United States? Asked one uh, internet user. Uh, Another Chinese colleague Uh, restating the rights of one minority group uh, should not be at the expense of violating the other. Uh, We have the right uh, to use our own language. So there, I think, is an example um, where, you know, racism is such a a hot topic and there there are right and good reasons why it's such a hot topic, but distorting the way that people kind of understand what other people are saying. When it comes to us as Christians, if it leads us to distort our reading of Scripture— and we end up concluding that Jesus uttered a racial slur and uh, you know, he needed to be um, kind of corrected by this woman, you can see how far we've gone uh, from uh, what the Bible says. Racism is real, it's addressed by the Bible, but it's not addressed by this kind of overreach or the kind of you know, blasphemous overreach that we saw in the, uh, the earlier quotes. But Ian Paul, and again I've, I've uh, put his... Um, Uh, reference on the um, outline, which is very helpful. Uh, This is a very helpful quote from Ian Paul. Um, He says, perhaps also there is a a more explicit agenda to challenge orthodox understandings of who Jesus is by taking the risky step of thinking that the Jesus we find in the New Testament isn't actually a model for us, but is frail ignorant and sinful too. Uh, This then means that the teaching of the New Testament is not binding on us, 
but as part of the trajectory of development which continues through history so that we in the 21st century now represent the pinnacle of revelation and our understanding reveal the true wisdom of God. Now, sadly, you know, the gospel and even the Jesus in the gospels doesn't actually turn out to be as enlightened as we are. Um, that, that, I think, is often what's going on, you know. We, you know, we, we know what, what uh, you know, the truth is we, we know what kind of, uh, our ethic is the most developed, and if we see something that doesn't match our ethic in the New Testament, well, you know, that's just because, you know, even Jesus was constrained by his, you know, his time and place. And, you know, by arguing like that, we, you know, we're ending up in a very, very dangerous uh, place. But I just want to finish um, with uh, a, a positive note, and then we'll take some questions. Um, just a reminder that it is this woman in both Matthew's Gospel and Mark's Gospel, uh, outside of the covenant community, a Gentile, a Canaanite, no less, an enemy of God's uh, people, who is in both Gospels presented as this wonderful model of discipleship. Okay. Happy to take um, questions from the floor, questions from the uh, internet. Firstly, why don't we thank Pete for giving us that. Thank you. thank you for helping us carefully look at the Bible um, amidst some of these really content contentious questions that we have in our current day. Um, as mentioned before, uh, this is the code J843 to ask questions on Slido. We do have a few questions already. Um, so, Pete, are there other examples of Jesus using such strong language to provoke a response of faith in the Gospels? Um, yeah, not, I think this is the strongest. Um, I think the, the encounter with the centurion in um, Matthew 8, if you read it as a question, you know, there's... there's um, the, you know, the centurion approaches Jesus to have his servant healed, and Jesus responds, am I to heal him? You know, that, that there's, there is a sort of starkness uh, to that, if we, we read that as a question, but I think this is the one that's the most um, uh, yeah, striking in its, in its harshness. Yeah. Got a question. Uh, you mentioned that the word for dog is in the diminutive form. Yeah. Does this tone down or does it actually increase the harshness of... Yeah, good, good question. Um, th there's a, quite a bit of debate about this. You'll read it and, and some commentators just <clears throat> almost want to sidestep you know, the whole question by um, you know, saying that the diminutive um, makes it less, less harsh. Uh, the problem is, um, I think in both passages... Um, there's a couple of other words where uh, the diminutive is, is used. It's a, it's a sort of different ending. So it, it's, it's not as if that kind of stands out in the passage. And so that's why people say, actually, it, it's not as significant as we might, um, um, you know, we, we, we might first think. But, but others want to say, no, um, we're not talking about the kind of wild street dogs. We are talking about the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the household dogs. Um, so I'm not really answering the question. I'm just saying it's it's tricky. I, I wouldn't put too much weight on it. Um, um, but I think the, the one thing we've got to remember is, you know, um, we, you know, if, if I call someone a dog in, in English, that, that is a very strong thing. Um, but we've got to be careful of not sort of importing our kind of emotional response to this word in, in, into the first century. Um, and um, yeah, e even even if we're not sure about you know whether the, the diminutive makes it kind of hard, it, it's not it's not necessarily going to sound the same as if if one of us was to call someone else a, a dog. Thanks, Pete. Um, so you mentioned at the beginning we looked at some of the alternative readings. Yeah. Um, even though we might not agree with these, but what can we learn from yeah. some of these readings? Yep, well, that, that, you know, that, that uh, alternate reading of, you know, seeing it as puppy, it goes too far, but at least kind of sort of says, um, again, we're not going to, that, that, you know, this woman wouldn't have heard it the same way that we would 
emotionally hear it if someone called us a dog. The, the second reading is really interesting, this idea that um, um, you know, J- Jesus is not, is not in the kind of power, um, you know, he, he's not the sort of dominant figure. And, and I think that is helpful. Um, and it's a very naive reading of the New Testament to sort of say, oh, the Jews were, you know, they had the power. No, no, they, they didn't. They were, you know, ruled by the Romans. And, you know, he is in, uh, in kind of Tyre, this wealthier foreign area where they had um, kind of oppressed the Jews. Now, I think the, the example that we had went a step too far. Um, but it also, it just sort of gives us pause to say that this is not a dynamic I, like the illustration I used of the kind of you know Wall Street banker with his immigrant cleaner, that that is just not the dynamic that's going on. Again, because we're not thinking in terms of racial power um, structures. That, that's just not what the text is doing. It's not a racial power structure. It is you know it's covenant community, non-covenant community, wicked you know I- I- evil doers, those those in the family. It's a, it's along moral lines rather than on hierarchical lines. So that you know when we Contemporary analysis of racism, you know, hierarchy is, is kind of embedded in that, and that's just not in the text. And so even though I wouldn't go as far as that first reading, I think it, it debunks the idea that we've got this kind of um, hierarchy. Sorry, that's a long answer. To Good question. Um, can you say a little bit more about the sending mission language? I think it's talking about in Matthew, and how the Old Testament background would have informed Jesus' understanding of people from other nations yeah Matthew's gospel is is fascinating Uh, the the dynamic um, the move um, more more so than any of the gospels Matthew kind of stresses in Jesus earthly ministry that he's only uh, he's only been sent by the father for uh, the people of Israel and then um, you know, the end of the gospel has the great commission, again, stronger than any of the other gospels of the disciples being sent uh, to uh, the nations. So um, in terms of the Old Testament background, what's interesting in Matthew's gospel is it's Jesus' identity as son of David that is particularly tied to his ability to be um, the savior of, of the nations, which is kind of is, is really quite quite striking because you'd think that son of David would be his identity, you know, um, for for the people of Israel. But David is this idea of the son of David is is, um, um, you know, attributed or or tied to his ability to um, to be the savior of the nation. So the sending language, I think, it's the father is sends the son into the world, and then the son um, sends uh, as the son of David sends um, uh, the disciples uh, into the world. Uh, this is a, I guess, clarification question. So, um, you mentioned that Jesus isn't using this woman as a teacher's lesson plan, um, but then I think you also alluded that he was trying to draw out her faith. Yeah. Yep. Sorry, that that teacher's lesson plan is is a reason that people reject the reading that I'm going. That they're sort of saying, you know, no, he's not testing her faith because that's just turning her into a teacher's lesson plan. And it's sort of it almost kind of uh, belittling her or you know dehumanizing her. So I'm not saying that. I'm saying that he um, is using this kind of strong encounter uh, to to bring out the faith um, in this woman in in the same way that he does uh, with other people. Um, it's an interesting question here. Should we read anything into the fact that the woman doesn't seem to reject the label of dog? I don't think we should read in, in anything. We should read out the fact that she, she accepts Jesus' verdict on her. And it's quite striking. I think um, the English translations both have yes, Lord, but I think it's Matthew that has the, the actual Greek word for yes. You know, she accepts Jesus' verdict on her life. And in the context of, you know, uh, Mark, earlier in Mark 7, earlier in Matthew 15, Jesus talked about the sinfulness of the human heart. You know, the human heart is sinful, and out of it come wicked things. Um, yes, Lord, I accept your verdict on me, that I am not righteous in myself. I, you know, I am a, I am a, a dog in the, in the biblical sense. I'm someone who is kind of outside of the covenant community. I'm someone who is, uh, you know, assigned with the wicked, wicked um, 
but you know, have mercy on me. So it's, it's, it's quite a graphic way of, you know, you're a sinner, yes, Lord, have mercy on me. That, that's effectively what the dynamic is. Um, you know, you're a sinner, yes, Lord, have mercy on me. So yes, I think we can learn a lot from that. The last question, um, I'll just read out. Our culture is obsessed with progress and moral evolution. Any useful apologetic tips for approaching chronological snobbery? Yeah, chronological snobbery, you know, as if we in the 21st century have the most, you know, highly developed ethic. I mean, it's a big question and, how, you know, how do you deal with it? Um, and, you know, a passage like this, I mean, we, we spent, you know, a good hour and a bit kind of working through it and thinking of it. We, you know, we all know the Bible well, and we can sort of see what Mark and Matthew are doing. Um, for someone to just come cold to this, you, you, can, you can understand why they kind of react against it. Um, but I think, you know, the, the, the New Testament, um, you know, the emphasis on love, the emphasis on hospitality, there's so much that challenges our kind of um, individualism, our selfishness. Uh, self-centeredness so um, yep kind of popular blogs can get all high and mighty about you know this encounter but there's lots in the New Testament that kind of exposes our you know how far we we fall short of, of God's uh, standards um, I'm happy to take questions from the floor if there are any if there aren't any other Slido ones but um, if not Happy to leave it there. Okay. Let's thank Pete again. Okay. Thank you, Peter, for, I guess, showing us to be sensitive to these really big questions in society today, but also carefully looking at what the Bible is saying in the context that the Bible is in and not, helping, not reading into the text what uh, isn't quite there yet. No, so thank you, that. thank you again, Peter, for that. Uh, how about our closing prayer and we can have, I guess, an early mark for up in tea. Uh, Father God, uh, we praise you that you are the God of all nations and that our Lord Jesus, uh, the Messiah of Israel, he welcomes uh, men and women from all nations uh, into your kingdom. And we praise you that as sons and daughters, uh, we can enjoy all the spiritual blessings that we have in Jesus Christ. And we pray that as we uh, step into our world with uh, lots of big questions regarding race um, uh, help us to be sensitive and mindful uh, but also help us to know how to carefully read uh, your scriptures uh, to see the issues that you are, um, are teaching us through them um, and help us to be lights into this world and we pray all this in Jesus name Amen um, so that's I guess the end of this elective we, we are I guess 20 minutes early uh, so we can enjoy an early afternoon tea. Um, so thanks for joining us. And thank you for everyone joining us online as well.